<clears throat> Hello there and welcome. It is now a quarter to nine p.m. here in the UK, and you join me as I have been just watching um, with Kevin of Ipswich. He recommended this show to me called Highway, which was uh, based in Ipswich in 1987 with Harry Seacombe. I'll just show you a clip from this. It really is quite great uh, material and uh, very inspiring as far as the singing is concerned, especially. Enjoy the flight you got on booking.com. Well, yeah, forget, forget about that. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe that somewhere in the darkest night, a candle glows. I believe for everyone who goes astray, someone will come to show the way. I believe, I believe, I believe that the smallest, smallest prayer will still be heard. I believe that someone in the great somewhere is there. Training for life is part of the youth training scheme. I met someone else for whom YTS had been a good start. Relax. Set. I found him on the Northgate athletic track. His name is Austin Solomon. Oh, you've got good breaks, Austin. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Now, two wonderful things have happened to you in your short life. I mean, you were the junior uh, <laughs> tournament meter champion, weren't you? Yeah, for two years running. Then That's last enough. year I came the second uh, in the county and second in the eastern counties as well. That's right. And anyway, that's the second thing that happened here to you. And then anyway, this oh, guy yeah. is obviously, you know, a, a talented... Around. She came up here. Well, she a great athlete. The train, and I thought, yeah, she's a bit all right sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I started talking to her. And I found that I could talk to her about God. And everything, and she could talk to me about it. And you're just talking about. God. I know. We just found that we could just talk uh, to each other. You, you get some people you can talk to, and they sort of turn off or whatever. But with her, I could really talk to her about it. That's good. Self conscious. That's right. Yeah. What's about and um, I end up going to well, she asked me to go to church, and I thought, yeah, right. But yeah, right. didn't mind. I thought, just, yeah, I'll go to see her. But I thought, no, I better not because I want to go because I want to do for myself and because I want to know God. A Philly. So we're in town together one Saturday. And we met What's together? What? And he ah. went to go to church, and uh, Jesus. I made a promise that, sorry, sorry, that no, day that I'll go to church that. that Sunday night. No matter what church it was, I'll go to church. Well, I just go to and, the church uh, then. All right. Her, Jeez. And she came and uh, talking about it. Said, "Well, she's going to her church at St Matthew's." Yeah, That's incredible. You church, you've said it about. Yeah, that is incredible. You know, it's, like, it's like saying the Holy Spirit just came upon them, you know, and they're really just rejoicing. Oh. And I found that's where I want to be. You know, people say it's a boring place, church and all that. It's for old people. But it's not right, you know? That's not I true. I went there and I found what I want. old people. Me, I was personally wanting the glory. I want to walk the street and go, hi. And what people say to me, oh, look, there's Austin. That's me. But I didn't want, now I don't want it no more. I found what I want. I found God. So found basically love, you were a glory, bit and I found all my riches in well. love with the idea of being famous. Myself. And then you changed. And now and so that's good. And so it was that Austin Solomon introduced us to the pure joy of a bop service in St. Matthew's Church. Bop, B-O-P, where everybody who comes literally brings other people. Very strong. Rejoice, rejoice, my 
church to reach out into the community this is David, a good bit what is the bop scheme you mean the bop scheme uh, <laughs> the bop. it's, a, <laughs> it's a, a service for young people held in ipswich uh, at st matthew's church it started about four years ago um, as a result of uh, a lot of feelings amongst people that uh, we ought to do something for the young people of the town following the david watson mission in the town then following on mission england there's a tremendous sense that we were letting the young people down we really needed to spend a lot more time concentrating on young people so at st matthews about uh, uh two years ago we started uh by allowing young people to take over the church one sunday evening per month and the rector said well you can do what you like and i, I still think he regrets it but if, if, if what happened was we started off with about 20 young people meeting yeah. together and just enjoying free worship and then the thing has grown in two years, to, so that now we have about Just four to five hundred young people. The church has again been welcomed by the people. Here's a simple reading that summarizes it. It's read for us by Georgie Glenn. One Sunday morning, drowsing in the back pew of a little country church, I dimly heard the old preacher urge his flock to stop worrying about your own halo and shine up your neighbors. And it left me sitting up wide awake because it struck me as just about the best 11 word formula for getting along with people that I ever heard. I like it for its implication that everyone in some area of life has a halo that's worth watching for and acknowledging. I like it for the picture it conjures up, everybody industriously polishing away at everybody else's little circle of divine light. I like it for the firm way it shifts the emphasis from self to interest and concern for others. Finally, I like it because it reflects a deep truth. People have a tendency to become what you expect them to be. People have a tendency to become what you expect them to be. How very true. Which brings us back to the first point we made in this program. That the church finds its way into our lives in ways we would hardly expect, like the shopping center, 
I've been to those the streets of the world myself. Many voices. And all we have to do, as the people of Ipswich seem to have done, is to open our ears to listen. So, if there's anything to be learned from Ipswich, it is that the church is always there, speaking to us in whatever kind of voice we expect of it. It's wonderful to consider that, as we said before, there are so many people, and each one is different from all the rest. And yet, there's still somebody who can speak to each one individually. That's the one thing which, despite our differences, unites us all. Mm. So it seemed fitting to join with the Olive Quantrill singers and the choir of St. Mary La Tower to sing Onward Christian Soldiers. <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers, marching us to war. And Jesus, I put it This is the best bit. Christian soldier says the hymn, and religion certainly is on the march here in Ipswich. Happily, as David Hennessy said, it's attracting more and more young people. Next week, Highway goes to Rochester. I'll see you then. stuff there. As you can see, uh, 
That was Highway, 1987, uh, starring Harry Seacombe, presenter and great singer there. Uh, he uh, obviously, you know, comes on in the show and sings. Um, I could never really do justice to his singing, but uh, good evening to Gary in the chat as well. I just wanted to say thank you again for the use of your Blu-ray of uh, Don't Look Now, which hasn't really got a lot of views as a video, but maybe people will eventually see it. I mean, it's it's a bit strange because I did a video, for instance, in the past for the Friedkin film The Guardian, and, uh, you know, it got like a thousand, uh, thousands of views, actually. And uh, I don't know if that was just some strange thing, but... Uh, I think I did another commentary on something else, and it certainly got more than 500 views. So I would have thought that there would have been interest in Don't Look Now from somebody, but um, the best thing I can say really is uh, I posted it on the on a group for the 70s on Facebook, like 70s movies and things, and uh, a couple of people on there liked it. So what more can you ask for, really? I'm not expecting some kind of, you know, huge audience necessarily but um i wouldn't uh, complain if if there was one eventually but uh i suppose you know just the nature of the channel confuses people perhaps a bit but um as long as me and johnny enjoyed doing it that's all that matters really so so yeah that's that was uh a lot of songs you know about belief and uh believing in certain things you know whether it's uh, religion or just yourself having a sense of self or that harry seacombe was even talking about if you sort of relate to somebody you know you see uh what you kind of expect to see sometimes perhaps this is true uh in terms of he was relating it of course into a church sort of religious side of things which i suppose is true as well but uh in a general sense i think you know people are what they are uh i don't necessarily think that just because you look at them in a certain way or perceive them in a certain way that will necessarily always be you know how you find them i think sometimes people can be very surprising uh otherwise you know you just sort of you know, everybody's almost like, you know, expecting kind of everybody to be a certain way and that's it. But that would suggest that everybody's almost um, a bit like being in the army or something or a bit robotic, which is, I don't really think that that's true. You know, people aren't like that all the time. So I think people can be very unpredictable which is one thing that actually uh, bothers me. You know, it scares me sometimes, but uh, I don't think I'm kind of unusual in that sense. But um, in terms of belief as well and that kind of program and everything, uh, this new Exorcist film being called The Exorcist Believer, first in a trilogy, uh, the second one has already been named as um, Deceiver. So if I had to guess what the third one was going to be called, probably heret the heret third one will probably be called her the heretic part two. I imagine that logically follows on. Uh, as a very you know intelligent person, I think I, I'm right on that probably. But uh, could also be The Exorcist Part 3, starring Liam Neeson. I think if Liam Neeson was in that third part, that would guarantee success. Um, judging by the, the director, David Gordon Green, he's been somewhat lambasted amongst the, you know, hard, well, not hardcore, but just general horror community, uh, particularly stateside, you know, for the uh, Halloween films because of uh, the way he took Halloween ends in a... Um, sort of slightly meta or slightly odd direction perhaps i don't really know 
I don't mean it's not it's not going off in the direction necessarily that uh, Season of the Witch was Halloween Three Season of the Witch, where Michael Myers is not even in the film. I sometimes wonder maybe it would have been better if they'd actually done that. But it uh, it's definitely more focused on a character called Corey, I think, and it sort of doesn't really fulfil the what it was advertised as in the trailer and things like that. So that's that's part of the issue with it for people, and they just found it uh, too, you know, just trying to be different, but not really succeeding in that i suppose that's how a lot of people may have viewed it for me i wasn't really sure what to think of it really because i only ever watched the first one properly halloween um halloween begins <laughs> <laughs> oh no what is the first one called it's the first one just called halloween then it's halloween kills then it's halloween ends even that, though, is my problem. You know, I mean, I saw the first one. I thought it was a pretty good actual update of the whole Halloween story, really, into a film which wasn't necessarily as out there as the Rob Zombie films or, you know, gruesome kind of uh, just the style of, of Rob Zombie obviously was different and a bit more sort of... Um, grunge style almost you could say i think david gordon green is a good director and i think the exorcist believer will probably be a pretty well made decent film but it probably won't necessarily be a massive hit with people who were just you know into the original exorcist necessarily because um new reports are that it doesn't include any projectile vomiting necessarily uh or head spinning and maybe you know no priests flying downstairs so the whole film will probably act as like rather a two-hour prologue which i think is a bit uh cheeky or lazy even of filmmakers but on the other hand you know if you're going to make three films then i suppose that's fine and uh i think from what little i know that linda blair appears at the end briefly Alan Burstein, of course, is in it a lot, um, which begs the question, you know, are we actually going to see any locations from the original Exorcist, as in the Exorcist Steps and Georgetown, where the where Reagan and her mother lived in the original film? I mean, if they live in that location now, then you may say, well, what's the point of showing it, or why would the film show it? But that's sort of ignoring what these films should be about in the ter in terms of, you know, mood, atmosphere. And, uh, you know, I hope Marlena doesn't mind me mentioning that she was talking about this or writing about it to me, saying that she didn't find the original Exorcist scary because she's not religious. And my response was, I don't find it religious, religiously scary as such. I find it more just scary on a mood or in its sort of subtle aspects, the original Exorcist, which sounds almost uh, unlikely considering the film, but, you know, just the location and the overall feel of that is what I found scary, if anything. And, you know, the original starting of it being in Iraq and then it shifts into this uh, area, you know, in... Washington DC in America. So it becomes very much like this sort of, it feels like there's something bigger at work than just what we can imagine even, which is perhaps uh, more of a religious sense of things in the sense of, it doesn't necessarily have to be one specific religion. You know, it can be just a general sense that there's more than meets the eye, that kind of idea, or at least you know, we don't really know the full extent of what's going on here. As in, clearly, you know, the film depicts that she's possessed. It's pretty ridiculous to suggest that this is all, you know, a result of, like, basically her being ill or something as a result of, say, 
the psychological stress of being maybe abused or something like that, which is never clearly indicated. So therefore, to just put it on top of the film is, you know, it's basically just putting your own thoughts into something, which is fine. But on the other hand, if the film doesn't really indicate that, um, there's no real clear indication that Reagan was sexually abused. So we have to go with the film and see that she is, you know, possessed by a a Syrian demon called Pazuzu, a demon of the wind. And uh, apparently in the new Exorcist Believer, it doesn't have Pazuzu in at all. So that makes you think, well, you know, they're going to have Pazuzu in the second or third film and uh, maybe Reagan will be in it more. Especially since, you know, Linda Blair is younger, obviously. Um, Alan Burstein definitely looks decent in the in this new film, but uh, she's by no, you know, by no means young now. She's no spring chicken, I mean, and uh, just good on her for doing it, really, even though she says readily, you know, I'm doing this for the money because uh, I want to give people scholarships to become actors. So... You know, she she no doubt got rewarded handsomely for this film. And from the trailer and everything that I've seen of it, um, including now a briefly available Japanese trailer, which was only about 30 seconds, I think, a teaser, I suppose they would call it. You know, it shows a few different bits and pieces, but nothing majorly sort of... Big. I just hope they haven't showed all of the sort of best bits in the trailers. And uh, some people have said that, you know, they were genuinely scared during the recent showings. Uh, there was a recent screening of it, uh, sort of, I think the film might have been re-edited a bit or they reshot even some scenes. But as far as I know, anyway, um, I can't really imagine that when I see it that I'll be like, scared particularly uh to the level of like the original exorcist because that film is more like i said about the mood and i don't really think that this is going to be able to recapture that kind of level of uh atmosphere and just sheer uh quality of filming that friedkin managed really um who obviously with him just passing away recently in fact probably will increase some interest in the original uh, The Exorcist from 1973, with it being the 50th anniversary, of course. Um, I think it doesn't mean that this film in any way should be trying to act as a tribute to the original Exorcist or anything like that. But I think if it's uh, better than Exorcist The Beginning, then you know, Rennie Harlan's kind of like remake of the ill-fated Dominion, which it ended up being called by uh, Paul Schrader, you know, then that would be a big plus. So, yeah, I mean, I like some of the imagery used in the trailer. I like the shot, for instance, of the dogs fighting, the uh, shots of the girl where she's on the bed and things. It doesn't look like it's been done cheaply. Uh, it looks quite well thought out in terms of the special effects as well, in terms of the physical special effects. It's not just CGI'd or sort of cheesy like it is in uh, The Exorcist. Sorry, The Pope's Exorcist, which was just too much for me. I mean, you know, that film was not scary in the slightest, but I mean, some people may enjoy it purely on the basis of it just being kind of comical to some extent. I don't know. Thanks for watching anyway, Gary. I appreciate it. I would have actually shown that 30 second teaser of uh, The Exorcist um, Believer, but it does, it somehow has become unavailable, the Japanese teaser trailer. Um, it just showed a few extra bits, like a shot of a church from outside with the birds, you know, flying off ominous or startling you know that kind of thing I, I think the film looks like it's been filmed well but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have been filmed in a way which is sort of you know paying tribute to the original film i mean obviously they're not going to be paying tribute to 
uh, The Exorcist 2. As much as I do like that as a film, even though it's, it is ridiculous, of course, but um, that's what I like about it. Just it's pure silliness and it's kind of hippie, new age type of thinking, you know, which I think was very much in at the time. Uh, whether Borman really made a, a proper film out of it, I wouldn't say he did properly really no it seemed like all a bit over the place but um i certainly don't think it's as bad as people like freakin made it out to be um and it's got a lot you know of enjoyable aspects about it and it is visually quite effective in certain wet scenes but uh you know like reagan on the top of the <laughs> the skyscraper in new york and it's sort of uh you know, it looks like she's literally on the edge. I mean, that is very bad if you've got vertigo and things like that, which I do have to to some degree. But, um, you know, it's just completely incon incoherent, I imagine, to many people who um, saw the first film. You know, why is it not set in Washington, whatever? You know, and then in the end, it finishes with a set of Washington because apparently they couldn't get permission or something like that, you know, to film at the original house. No doubt they couldn't get permission to demolish the, the actual real house and have, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, locusts flying around everywhere with Linda Blair in her nighty, like doing some kind of lasso move to save everybody, uh, everybody's soul. But, um, yeah, in terms of Exorcist 3, I think that film is very highly acclaimed now, often by a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, and I say it with, like, some reservations, like, but I don't necessarily think it's um, as good as some people might claim. It's I think probably if there was a combination of the director's cut and the sort of final cut which the studio wanted you know with an actual exorcism at the ending I, I think um the longer dialogue in a lot of the director's cut of it which i've seen you know i bought the disc of it it's good definitely good but it makes the film even seem more slow paced than it is originally and there's a lot of good scenes in it especially like where kinderman's supposed to be sleeping you know he's dreaming and he has this dream where it's this big cathedral or, you know, heavenly place with Fabio in there of all people and Samuel L. Jackson in a very odd cameo, uh, dressed very similarly to how Calvin Lockhart appears in um, Twin Peaks Firewalk with me in the, you know, playing the electrician, I think he plays, the animal life guy. And at the start of the film, it says, I had dreams of falling down a flight of stairs, a long flight of stairs and a rose. I was dreaming of a rose. And this seems like too close to the writing of the script of Fire Walk With Me to be just a coincidence. I think the Blue Rose idea could have been influenced by this, The Exorcist uh, 3, or Legion, as Blatty wanted to call it, really. Um as the book was called. And I think like the book, I'm not sure whether the book mentions any dreams of roses. I think that's something in the film, but I definitely think like people like Lynch and Bob Engels were inspired by films around at the moment as that Maggie Mayfish um, points out, you know, the similarities between the start of Fire Walk With Me and then sequences at the start of Silence of the Lambs in particular. So, but yeah, I don't think that Lynch was trying to make, you know, his own Exorcist 3 or Signs of the Lambs, but I think he was sort of building these into his whole vision as such. I have seen The Blood on Satan's Claw, yeah, I remember. Um, I don't remember it that well, though. I, I mean, I remember sort of like bits of stuff in the earth. There's something going on, I can't remember, and something, you know. Can't remember whether it's a claw in the earth or what is going on, but it's it's a bit of a folk horror, isn't it? From 
before, you know, way before films like Midsummer, etc. Uh, but more coming from that era of, you know, Dennis Wheatley and uh, Satanic Panic and all that kind of thing. Um, but it's Yeah, I, I can't remember really anything that specific about the film, unfortunately, Gary, I'll say, but maybe you can point out something about it that I need to go back and watch or something. Is that on Exorc the Exorcist 2 documentary on YouTube? I think I might have seen it pop up before, but... Um... Yeah, there's been a another. There's been a re-release or a re ramp sort of mastered re-release, whatever of uh, Exorcist Two, The Heretic, because I I can never say heretic properly. Um, heretic, heretic. You know, the film is like something that probably would be good if they had like a load of deleted scenes, and it was just sort of this mammoth two and a half hour film. Or even longer, but uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think that's the case in terms of any uh, extras and stuff like that. You know, no deleted scenes, particularly. There may be a couple, but I don't think there's an immense, um, you know, something comparable to say Fire Walk with Me, that level of like, and basically another film. Um, I think, you know, The Exorcist 2 is sort of a film that probably needed a better edit and probably a reshoot for some bits, in my opinion, anyway. I think the ending, particularly on the set of the, um, the house, you know, supposed to be the Georgetown house and even showing the steps and things a bit, it's, you know, it's pretty obvious that this is not, like the real location when you watch it it's well done but it looks like basically you know like in a museum or something like if you've for instance the uh in york they have the castle museum which is actually really brilliant i mean as a museum probably the best i've ever been in and they've got two streets you know recreated in there but it felt like that you know like a bit compressed and a bit sort of uh just not as big as the real place, but they were kind of making it look bigger with maybe wide angle lenses or something. But yeah, it just, the ending of it is for me just one flaw because it's, you could tell even with the uh, Borman's different cuts of it, you know, it has different endings. There's more than one different, uh, there's two different endings, I think at least <laughs> as there is a different start for the film. Even there's one where, uh the priest the character played by um richard burton is going up steps and then in another version you don't see him going up steps so it's like make up your mind are you going to show that scene or not you know and going up the steps seems like a nice sort of since we you know they we make such a big deal of the steps in the original exorcist film and things like that so but to not actually be able to film it at the real location i think it would have been a better to either just do something else completely different for the ending or wait until they actually could film it at the real location in some to some extent at least and just think of a different ending rather than the whole house crumbling down and all that because that comes up i mean that really feels like something from i mean just goes into being comedy at, at, at times uh, easily into comedy <laughs> Feels almost like something from a you know a Ghostbusters film in the eighties or something. But four K release. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's a shame, really, Gary, that that film just isn't that The Exorcist Two isn't really. I don't think maybe they even if there were extra scenes and things like that, they maybe just didn't keep them or something, unfortunately. that's Because uh, at the end of the day, the film made enough money at the box office and things like that. Things like that, I mean, or, well, you know, specifically like that. And then also home video then. Uh, 
to be basically you know profitable but it, of course it wasn't the level of profit they wanted from a film like that a property which followed um such a sort of controversial but also you know highly thought of horror film and so or i mean some people would call the exorcist like a thriller more than a horror film perhaps even so you know i just don't think borman was interested whatsoever <laughs> he didn't really have any interest in making a true sequel in that sense so anyway all i'll say is just don't stop believing and uh i'll see you again very soon hopefully in the trees as always so thank you everybody for watching thank you of course to gary in the chat and cheerio for now bye